Hello, greetings from the Pacific Northwest in the United States where it is still Saturday night. I want to thank the organizers of this uh, webinar, um, the Jnana Advaita Bidham, as well as the Sri Vishnu um, Mohan Foundation. Today, I'm going to be looking at uh, the Bala Krishna episode. Let me just uh, get this going. All right, the Bala Krishna episode um, from a literary standpoint. Um, and I'm going to be looking at the aesthetic impact of, um, on the devotees of the literature itself. What I want to mention uh, up front is that I've illustrated this PowerPoint with pictures from my own collection of vintage religious posters. Now, I collected these in the mid 1970s, so all of them are at least 45 years old, so now you know how old I am. Um, and uh, many of them were quite old at the time. So these uh, pictures are from posters that are 75 to 85 years old, and I hope you enjoy them. I'd like to be begin by identifying the parameters of this study. Um, Krishna, the Krishna episode is really broken down into five different kinds of components. He ate butter, he was tied up specifically to a mortar, he dragged the mortar between two trees and knocked them over, and at times the trees are ascribed to uh, contain spirits. Um, I'm looking at a survey of literature, and it is not all inclusive, but it does uh, cover most of the significant iterations of the story. Um, when we look at the Harivamsha, we see there is no butter theft mentioned at all. The Krishna and Balarama were naughty toddlers. They, Krishna was tied then around his stomach to a mortar, and he then dragged the mortar between two trees and knocked them down. The trees are described as having been worshipped. With the Vishnu Purana, um, there is also no butter theft mentioned. We see basically the same uh, story of the kids being naughty and the tie to the mortar. But when we get to him knocking the mortar off, I mean, trying to drag the mortar, it's because he very realistically wanted to knock it off. And the trees are not um, possessed of any spirits. I want to move to an earlier uh, Silpadiharam, the, the Tamil epic where we do find one mention of one component uh, that we've talked about in the butter theft. Here, there is a Dorga-like goddess, Aye. She's called the Pinai, the young girl of the clan. She's also called Mal's young kin, Mal being the dark one and name of Krishna. So she is Krishna's relative and she holds the conch and disc in her hand. She is praised as follows. You were gracious kicking the rolling disguised cart that your uncle made having walked on the Marudu. So she is ascribed the, the episodes of uh, killing the Shakadasara um, and walking on the Marudu rather than Krishna. She is actually um, a Vrishni uh, goddess who protects the clan. And here she is protecting Krishna from his evil uncle. She's also listed in uh, the Silpati Haram as having performed a stilt dance where she's referred to as Mayaval. That's the feminine, the dark woman. Mayavan, the masculine, the dark male is a name for Krishna. So she is clearly a, a Krishna Vaishnavite figure. And the stilt dance uh, that she performs then is ascribed to Krishna later in Tirumangayalvar's texts. Also in the Silapariharam, we have a reference to the herder community performing a round dance called the Kuravai in Tamil, which is said to have been danced in the Bala Charida dramas. And this is uh, written in Tamil, Bala Sarida Narahangar. So it's actually a transliteration from Sanskrit. So we know that in the fifth century that um, Bala Charida uh, dramas, in other words, ep episodes of Krishna's childhood or being performed uh, for public entertainment. 
let's then, uh, we're going to start a chart of all of these episodes and how they occur. And we see so far, no butter has been stolen. But the episode of being tied to a mortar has a strong continuity with the Marutha tree or Arjuna tree, the same tree um, in Sanskrit or Tamil. With, uh, so this is, there's a continuous narrative there. Let's talk about the Bala Charita. It was ascribed to Vasa in the fourth century, but we do not actually have that fourth century text. What we do have is a seventh century Bala Charita that was written in the Pallava court. In other words, a South Indian version, and it, it comes from a Kuriyattam uh, theater repertoire, actually. In that um, text, Krishna goes in and out of everyone's houses eating a whole variety of dairy products. Um, and the neighbors then complain. So there's actually this element of the neighbors' complaints are added when we get to the, uh, to, uh, the Balachayda. And then she ties him with a rope to a mortar around his stomach. So that's of interest. Um, then after that, it says, Tadas Tadapi. Now, my minimal amount of Sanskrit was 45 years ago. Um, so, but if I'm not mistaken, this actually creates a break in the action later, tadastadap, at another time afterwards. When he saw the mortar um, moving, he threw it at Donavas, the demons that were the Arjuna trees. So he actually throws the mortar to at them, then he goes and smashes them and knocks them down um, with physically with his body. So if he was actually tied to the, if he was tied to the mortar, he wouldn't be able to throw it. So I do think there's a break in continuity there that he is throwing the mortar at the trees. So that's also a very unique aspect of the story. I want to talk a little, just a minute about um, another peripheral, um, reference, and that is again in the Aitiyota Kurvai, which is overall dated in the fifth century, but Friedhelm Hardy has very convincingly argued that there are three uh, short verses at the end of Canto 17 that are interpolations that were written at the very earliest at the seventh century and possibly much later. So we have to take this, uh, the dating with a grain of salt. Um, in one of the, oh, also I want to mention, we also know that one of these was written in a Kali Thalisai meter, which is um, a bhakti meter that was used very productively by Piti Alvar in the ninth century. Also, there's one of his written in um, Kocha Hakalipai, which is also a later meter. So we see these are interpolations, but what do they have to say? The hands that churned the sea are the hands that were tied by Yashoda's churning uh, rod. So we see that here the hands are turned, he's, are tied. He's not tied um, around his stomach. Another one says, the mouth that swallowed the worlds is the mouth that ate the butter stolen from the pot nets. Now the concept of stolen comes in Tamil as kalavu, kalavinal, by theft. And that they are stolen from the pot nets from the Uri is also, both of those are quite late additions, uh, specific additions. Um, these are not fifth century elements. So we have to take this as somewhere between the seventh and ninth century that these verses occur. So now we're adding to our chart and we see, aha, we now have butter theft occurring on the chart. But by the time the butter theft occurs on the chart and is a uh, immediately associated with being tied to a mortar, then we have a break between that and the mud of the trees. And we will follow this. Um, it's a shift in focus, really. Now we can look at the early Arwars. Um, and so we're looking here at the four Andadis. We see butter theft as continuing to occur in um, three of the authors. We see here in the Mudal Tilravandadi, the first Andadi, that Krishna was tied close to a mortar when he ate butter and he sat howling. So um, he didn't immediately uh, move with the mortar, but he sat, he stayed there howling, crying like any other child who's being punished. Um, he it was bound by a rope 
and we see that he ate ghee and butter and milk. Now there are references to the maradu, but they're separate. And in general, we find throughout the Alvars this very, very simple phrase that he went between maradu. That's all that it says. He went between maradu. Malizaibiran also adds to destroy the trees. So we learn a little bit more there. Proceeding to the eighth century, uh, Namalvar, and I just want to point out this darling picture of Krishna is from uh, a package of matches, actually. It was part of the cover of a package of matches, but I kept it because I thought it was sweet. Um, in the eighth century, we see eight, uh, 15 references to stealing butter, which is still very few, considering that Namalvar wrote over 1300 verses. But even out of that, we only see one reference to being tied to a mortar. So it is minimized. Um, we see that after he ate butter, that the herders beat him with a strong rope and he suffered. And then in Thiruvai Mori 131, he wept sitting with a mortar being tied. So again, he's depicted as a child who is being punished and is not happy about it. Um, there are references to the mud of the tree, uh, but uh, Namalvar only adds a little more information. He says, Saita having uh, toppled them. So we see when we add the Andadis and Namalvar, again, we have this, uh, We've added the concept of him weeping and suffering as a child, but we have this break uh, in continuity with the mother de trees. When we move to the a uh, little later in the eighth century to Tirumangai Alvar, his city at Tirumadal, we have finally a full narrative of the butter theft episode. The characters are developed along with their personalities. So I want to read this for you so you get the full sense of the story. One day there in a cowherd village, she with the hips in a fine girdle, fine feet, red coral lips and lovely bodice covered breasts, having catching hold of a churning rod to tie it up after having churned fine curds all of one day so that her lovely sides ached, that simple lady, her brow full of sweat, putting the butter which had curdled in another pot, then lifting it to the rope netting and storing it so that it rested well, until the time that simple lady went, her eyes like battling lances, he, like one who knows nothing, sleeping in a feigned sleep, then waking and reaching his hands up to his broad garlanded shoulders and gulping the never sating butter, then toppling a nearby pot full of buttermilk in the place he had previously lain, he lay like one who knows nothing. And she who saw him there as she came back did not see what she had stored, pounding her belly in anguish saying, who, who would come in here except this gentleman? Yes, you did this with a long rope. So all those in the village saw being of unrelenting rage tying him tightly to a mortar as she beat him with his belly unfilled, he could not bear it. So he is depicted again as a, a human child who could not bear the punishment and who is a sneak thief as well. In the Pediat Tirumadal, uh, Tirumange Alvabar gives us a little bit more information. Um, in this uh, version, we see that Krishna is creeping in with a thieving eye. He opened a closed door. So they've even tried closing the door against him and he enters and he gulps curds. And he was tied to a mortar with a strong rope having been caught by those simple ladies. Madavorho, plural. So the ladies themselves, the neighbors um, catch him rather than go to complain to Yashoda. Uh, the neighbors themselves tie him up. In the Peri at Thirumorli, we see lots more references to stealing, stealing butter, but here the text itself is over is 1,084 verses, so obviously there's much opportunity for that to occur. We see uh, that he's tied with a, a rope and five references to the mortars, but again, we see references 
with wide eyes flooding tears, staying like a dark elephant tied to a stake. So it's very clear he sits weeping and complaining, um, but stays tied. He doesn't move with the mortar to do anything further. In 674, he howled, sobbing, being stuck when tied with an excellent rope to the mortar. Regarding the mud of the trees, Tirumang Yalvar and his period Tirumur does mention the mud of the trees, again, most frequently with just went between mud, a very simple phrase, but we do learn that um, the trees broke, that they withered, um, that he destroyed them, pushed them over. Um, we also see that one reference in 834, he walked to break entwined mother having gone with a mortar when a herd is bound him. Now there's no reference to the butter theft in this poem at all. So it's kind of a gap. Um, and I want to read you what comes from 1149. This, it says, worship the toddler who practiced walking, running with a mortar when a full breasted herder woman tied him to it when he crept up to the butter so that the strong entwined mother to trees fell breaking. Here we have continuity of the, all the first four episodes without mention of the spirits, but yet there is a strong continuity between all of these in this uh, 11th uh, four nine. And I am very sorry to tell you, however, that for many reasons that I am still researching, I am very strongly convinced that this whole 11th section of the Periathiramorni is an interpolation written at a later date. So I do not find this episode to be from this period. And this is mostly because throughout the whole 11th section, we find a significant use of the modern present tense in Tamil. Now that present tense does, is not used in the first 900 verses of the Pedi Thirumori. So we have to ask, is this uh, still dated this, the same as the earlier part of Thirumori when we find modern present tense uh, so significantly present? No pun intended. Okay, we can move to the ninth century Pedi Alvar Tirumurli, which of course is predominantly about Gopala Krishna, a lot of uh, lovely songs to um, Bala Krishna, and there are many references to the butter theft. Uh, one particularly interesting is that he pushed with thighs and hands those who appeared when they rose from the Bhavaditas. So it looks uh, not that he pulled a mortar between them, but he actually push them over with his hands and feet. So that's interesting. Um, he, the mortar is mentioned once uh, when Krishna complains to his mother saying, didn't you tie me to a mortar? Um, we do find reference to the Bhanada trees, but again, it's just one simple phrase that he went between Maradas. So we can see now again, the, and I've used color coding obviously, to indicate that there, there are gaps here. We only see one place where there is some continuity, but that's in the text that I am thoroughly convinced is much later. Um, I've added Kula Sekhrin simply because uh, he has just one reference to Krishna's arms being tied. He never says he was tied to a mortar. And Andal is not the least bit interested in the butter theft at all. Um, no references occur. So. I want to, with regard to the butter theft episode, I want to look at the influence on the Alvars initially and of the Alvars after them. So the Alvars predominantly drew from the Harivamsha, and I'm taking this from Friedhelm Hardy's study. And we can see that uh, when we look at the return of Sandipani's children, that episode occurs in the Periya Tirumori as, where, as well as in the Periyalvar Tirumori, and that is in the Harivamsha, but it is not found in the Vishnu Purana. So um, we can see that there is it's identified that contact. I also want to mention a, quite a new uh, article by Dr. Sh Charlotte Schmidt. She is a scholar who studies um, Krishna episodes as well as others as they are found in sculptural motifs. She has observed in fifth century North India, a carving that appears um, at, the, at the beginning of 
panels that show episodes of Krishna's life, like uh, Shapirasura and Putana and so forth. At the beginning of those panels, she has noted a woman churning. This churning woman often is seated or standing next to the churning pot with a child at her feet or next to her with his arms uh, very clearly on the pot or sticking his hand in the butter. Now she perceives this um, not to be, she doesn't see that it's any theft. Uh, we don't see that there's any uh, surreptitiousness about it, but just it, it is a sets the scene that this is a story set in the uh, herder village. It's almost as if it represents the phrase, once upon a time when Krishna was a child in the herder village. And then it goes on to tell the other episodes in the rest of the panel. She has noted that this uh, occurs in the sixth, late 6th and early 7th centuries in Karnataka. And she believes that this um, sculptural motif was in a folk tradition reinterpreted as a butter theft and that that influenced the Alvar text in terms of picking up that story from uh, the folk element. In turn, the Alvars then heavily influenced the Bhagavata Purana, which also drew from the Vishnu Purana. The Bhagavata Purana incorporated a lot of new material um, from the Alvar text. Besides the butter theft episode, uh, we see Krishna eating dirt, the demon calf, the splitting the bird's mouth, stealing the gopi's clothes, which become very popular, um, choosing a wife by conquering seven bulls, marrying his cross cousin. All of these are episodes that occur in the Alvar literature first and are drawn into the Bhagavat Purana. So we see how much the Alvars have influenced that text with regard to um, Gopala Krishna stories. In particular, I find that the Gopala episodes seem to be very closely tied to Piri Alvar and his uh, foster daughter Andal. We see the incorporation of the Pavai Nombu ritual of Andal's Tirupave finds its way into the episode of stealing the gopi's clothes. The Vatsalya Bhakti of Piriyavar Tirumuni is very well developed in the Bhagavata Purana, even to the extent of saying that Putana gained the destiny worthy of mothers because of her contact with Krishna. I am particularly fascinated by book 10, number 35, which is called the Gopi Song, because we can follow language directly drawn from verses from the Peri Alvar Tirumori. And not only that, whereas book 10 is completely written in Sanskrit shloka, number 25, the Gopi Song, is written in quatrains. How do we know it's quatrains and not just two shlokas? It's a four line verse because of the rhyme, the four lines rhyme, not using Sanskrit rhyme, but using Tamil Yeduhai, second syllable rhyme. So these, this is uh, quatrains, four line verses written in Sanskrit, but rhyme using Tamil uh, rhyming prosody. I think that's fascinating. Let me just read to you from um, one, uh, one verse so you can see how closely tied uh, this is to Piriyalvar. A herd of dazed deer forgot to graze. The just-snipped grass slipping from their lips, listening they stood, transfixed, immobile, a scene from a painting. Now we go to the Bhagavat Purana. Pastured bulls, cows, and deer grouped afar, their minds bereft by the flute playing, with ears cocked and just bitten mouths full, were as if asleep, drawn in a picture. So here we can see there's clearly direct influence from Peri Alvar uh, specifically. Before we move on to the Bhagavatam, I just want to look back at um, the nature of the text. The early Puranic texts, without any reference to Krishna's butter theft, focus fully on this uh, supernatural feat of toppling over the trees. Um, the people within the Purana 
are, are surprised. They are represented as filled with wonder at this feat. Um, it is, they are full of fear and awe. So the deity's nature is depicted of one of Paratva, of supremacy. When you get to the Alvar texts with regard to the butter theft, the reference to the toppling of trees is very minimal. And the uh, mortar, the episode of being tied to a mortar is presented more as a means to depict Krishna's human trait and how he responds as a human child, wailing and weeping and unable to bear the pain. So the deity's nature in these verses is shown as one of saulabhya, accessibility. As we move chronologically and geographically, then the nature of these texts changes. The changes accompanied at the time a rejection of the atheistic beliefs of the Buddhists and Jains on, in South India and moved away from a view of God as transcendental as nirguna, as having no qualities. The Althars wanted to experience their deity face to face with their um, God having a familiar human face. They wanted to explore human relationships and emotions um, with the deity, that whether a mother or a lover or companion or an angry neighbor or in the Peri Thirumori even defeated enemy. In order to develop um, those human relationships, it required very compelling and vivid language uh, to have that emotion be evoked. Then after that emotion is evoked and the, the poem builds an aesthetic response, then by referencing the paratva nature of the deity, that emotion can be raised to bhakti. So we're talking about aesthetic mood here. And with the early Puranic texts, um, we really don't have much of a mood because there's really not much po poetry. There's not a lot of kavya in the Puranic texts. It's a narratives and the mood is more of adbhuta rasa of wonder. The Alvars, however, um, used many rasas, many moods, in particular the loving mood, Shringara, most predominantly, but from the point of Nayaki Bhava, the heroine's emotion, or Vatsalya Bhava, the emotions of a mother. I want to mention one thing here. The, if the poetry, when the poetry focus only on Krishna's majesty, it limits the development of human emotion that is needed for a personal relationship with God. When the poetry focuses only on Krishna's human qualities, then it would fail to raise the emotion to the level of religious devotion. You might feel some emotion if you hear a story about a little kid who's your neighbor's nephew's child or something. You might have an emotional response, but obviously it doesn't raise to the level of devotion. So the Alvars were able then to maintain a balance of saulabhya and paratva elements by distancing those elements, creating space between them. And this space opened up, uh, air opened up for the human emotions to flourish and then intensify in the bhakti. Let's quickly skim through then what happens in the Bhagavata Purana. We in, at the beginning see that she uh, that Krishna brings her joy and she has over overflowing affection for him. Uh, and then we see some philosophical commentary. Then we return to the story where she uh, chuckles at the antics of her son. And then she finds him um, feeding butter to the monkeys. And then we have a philosophical commentary. We return. She holds her son's hand who's weeping and rubbing his eyes, behaving like any human child who's been caught. And she sees that he is frightened and she is overwhelmed with love for him. Then we have philosophical commentary. Only then do we have a short area where he, he's tied to a mortar, more commentary. And then at the very end of that chapter, Krishna notices Kubera's sons who have been cursed to be Arjuna trees. And that chapter ends. There's a break. 
Then we go to the next chapter, which starts with a very long uh, 22 shlokas that tell the backstory of Kubera's sons. So um, we have stepped aside from the child Krishna, and then it tells us that Krishna knows that he has to fulfill a divine role to remove the, um, the curse of the celestials by releasing them from the trees. And so his moving with the mortar between the trees is really a divine destiny. Now we have a huge chart and all the pieces are there. And we see these constant gaps and this separation, even in the Bhagavatam, this huge interruption between the cont continuation of the uh, butter theft um, to being tied to the mortar and him behaving, Krishna behaving like a child. So as the butter theft is added to the story, then the episode of the, the miraculous uh, knocking down of the trees becomes minimized. The influence of the Alvars on the Bhagavatam can be seen even at this structural level of creating distance between Salabhya components and Paratva components. Kenneth Bryant did a study um, where he of the strategies and structures that the poet Surdas used in the Surasagra in Brajbasha, I think, in the 15th century. And he observed, even in that text, a uh, use of dramatic space between Laukika, the worldly, and Alakika, Alaukika, the unworldly. So even in the influence of the Bhagavatam into later poetry, we see this dramatic space, dramatic distance being used. But why? Why is that? Well, for one, we've seen that the different parts of the episode, the different components evoke different aesthetic moods and they have different poetic goals. So um, those can only be achieved when, they're, when they are separated. Um, the Alvars carefully applied this poetic technique of alterating so that these both could uh, um, be um, successful. And it seems that the ultimate goal of the Alvars was to have a personal experience, a personal relationship of God, and they wanted to share that. But that experience required a two-step process. First, the poetry had to develop um, a human emotion, a personal aesthetic experience in the poetry. In this case, a mother's love, Vatsalyabhava. But secondly, then, it had to be raised that the, to, the poetry needed to raise the emotion, to lift it to a totally different level of experience, to intensify its fervor so that a very personal experience of the deity could be developed, all being nurtured within that very pregnant aesthetic space that was provided by the Alvars in their bhakti texts. Um, before I end, I just want to mention that if someone would like a list of the sources that were used in this talk, you can send me a chat with your email and I will send it to you. Thank you very much.